Hey guys, welcome back to Seller Sessions. Stephen Selikoff is with me today. We're going to be having a chat about some factory stories that he's discovered in his uh, in his journey and uh, pick up some key points from here. So Stephen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Obviously, we're set up here in Estonia. Just converted the hotel room using the, the lamp and stuff here. Just thought it's more of a, a different vibe and away from the noisy exterior and stuff. But um, yeah, let's kick off. The, let's go into some of your uh, stories here. So how would you like to kick off? Well, I just came back from, from China last week. This time last week, I was still in China. 48 days. Wow. Every day of phase one, phase two, and part of phase three of the Canton Fair. And then um, every single day other than that was at a factory. Right. And it was incredible. It was wonderful being back in China. It was wonderful for China to be open. I was very concerned about factories being cautious about people visiting. Um, and they were very, very welcoming. Everyone was happy to come and visit. Um, and as we were chatting earlier, I also had some interesting adventures in all the mm. years of factories. Yeah. <laughs> I ran into one for the very first time. Mm. I ran into a factory with illegal labor. Right. I don't know if it was prisoners Literally or children. Pr- or, wow. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. It was intense. So can I tell you the story? Yeah, let's go straight Excellent. into the story. Yeah. So it's a cut and sew factory. And people who don't know what that means, that's a textile factory where they're literally cutting fabric and sewing fabric. Relatively easy. And I've gone to dozens and dozens of these. When you go in for the first time, you'll see that there's lots of people at sewing machines. And they'll have a stack of, of, of textiles, of fabric, and then a stack of finished pieces. And they'll be rows and rows like this, often piled up on the floor. That's what you expect. Which is why, by the way, always wash your clothes when you buy them <laughs> before you wear them the first time. Well, I stepped into this factory for one of my clients, and it was amazing. It was the cleanest, brightest lit factory I've ever seen. All of the stations were equally spaced apart. There was nothing on the floor. There were bins for them to go into, bins for them to come out of. Um, everyone had coverings on their head, and, and uh, they were wearing... Um, like PPE almost. It was just, it was amazing. I'd never seen anything like that. I was thrilled. Now, the person who was supposed to give us the tour couldn't make it. At the last minute, she got someone else to stand in for her, and that person brought her assistant along. But since none of them spoke English, this woman also brought along her daughter, like 15, 16 year old kid. And we went through the factory and they showed me all the pieces. They did not show me the showroom. Hmm. Now, it's interesting. When you see a factory in China, there's four things you should always look for. The office and showroom, the production floor. You want to see how and where they're doing QA. And you also want to see shipping, warehouse, where stuff comes in and where it goes out. And keep your eyes open to see where they're shipping so you can get a sense of who their clients are. So I'm going through this with this in my mind. And it's a little concerning that we didn't see a showroom. But we went right into the factory and it was beautiful, it was wonderful. And I asked about my client's prototype. And, and they started arguing between each other. And I asked again about the prototype. And they are arguing. And at that point, the teenage girl, hmm. but she turned to me and said, that prototype was sewn at the other factory. Right. So, other factory? Maybe this is a trading company. So I don't know. So I said, what other factory? Let's go. And they apologize, and they say it's only five minutes away. So we hop in the car, we drive four or five minutes, that's it. We get in there, and this time we go into a waiting room. And the waiting room has a curtain along one wall. And we're waiting, and they have to call upstairs and ask for permission to come see the factory floor. This is weird. I've never had this experience in years. And they call, and they say no, and they ask my patients, and they say no. So... I get up and I ask to go to the bathroom and they point out where it is and I go down to the bathroom and I come back. I am the worst house guest in the world. I become the mother-in-law that snoops everywhere. You don't want me visiting. Mm -hmm. Um, Because as I come back, I'm looking into offices, I'm taking pictures here and there. And when I get back to this waiting room we're in, I pull the curtain aside that's hiding one wall and I see all of their certifications. It's like, this is weird. Why would they cover their certifications? And it's not like a temporary curtain. It's, a, it's built in so they can open it or close it. 
So now the red flags are going off. I'm saying this is big question marks. Um, we wait, and then they get the okay for us to go upstairs to see the factory floor. Same company, second factory. I walk in, and there's work to be done, literally almost to the ceiling. I have to show you some photos mm. later on. It is, it is just gigantic. There's piles of work, and probably no more than 11 workers. Mm. And a lot of sewing machine stations without anyone there, but still having thread through the sewing machines. Mm. So these were sewing machines that were used very recently. And then there's also sections with sheets thrown over stuff that looks like maybe they were beds or bins or something. Um, and they tried to say everything's good and I'm walking through and I'm taking pictures and I'm smiling and the whole time I'm saying, this is scary, there's something going on here. So I got a bunch of photos of it and everything. Um, left and then got a hold of my client and explained the whole story. I said, they're hiding workers. Mm -hmm. They had to get people out, hide them while I walk through. They had to cover up or whatever it is they were covering up. It looked like beds next to the workstations. Um, and what they had, and apparently what they do is they have this showcase, beautiful, perfect cut and sew factory. Mm. And that's where they show people who do audits and that's where they show customers that come in. And only because this little kid did not know she's supposed to keep her mouth shut mm. did she let it be known that there's another factory where they're getting all of their work done. Yeah, Scary. It could be prisoners. It could be ethnic minorities. It could be child labor. I don't know, but mm. got the hell out of there. Yeah. So how did that... <clears throat> obviously, you got out there, but how do you lead that scenario? <coughs> there's one thing to lead, but how did you shut down the relationship and stuff? Oh, very simply. We just... Uh, first of all, I'm... I asked my client, of course, as one of my students, and I already knew what her answer was going to be. Mm. And I said, I just want to tell you what it is like. Yeah. That's why the prices are cheaper than everyone's. Mm. Um, and she says, well, I can't do work. I said, of course, I of course. don't think you can. Yeah. You still have to so, ask the client because it's their decision. The final decision lays exactly. with them, but the answer's obvious. Yeah. 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 And I'm, I'm lucky. Um, and I know there are people who do black hat this and black hat that, but I'm very, very lucky that I don't have to deal with people like that. And there's mm -hmm. no question what their, she was going to say. No yeah. question at all. So that's gone, and you know, walked away from that. And it's just a case of uh, thank you, but we're going to be working with a different factory. Mm -hmm. Let that be what it is. Yeah. So that was that was a scary factory factory situation. Uh, also, have a great factory situation. Let's do it. So I have uh, one of my clients had products being made over in Ningbo, mm -hmm. and they were paying about twenty two dollars eighty seven cents a unit, and that was way too high. They worked through someone they found who then found a trading company who found someone else and everyone has their hands out and it's like, mm. you know what it's like. So um, took a while to extricate themselves from that legally, mm. brought them to a new factory, had to pick up their molds. So the day that I arrived there, we authorized for the molds to be picked up, had to send two guys with a big truck and a forklift and um, uh, another guy to oversee them and the engineer from the receiving factory. Mm. Packed them all up into the truck, drove them from Ningbo to Shunda, which is just south of Guangzhou. Yeah. Got there. This factory was incredible. I mean, it is huge. Um, I went back after the um, molds were received just to review them. And they said they'd meet us with a car at the front gate mm -hmm. and go to where the molds are. I thought, like the first time, that there's going to be a different factory. No, it took 12 minutes just to go through their campus to get to the building where that where the molds were. This thing was is gigantic. 28,000 workers, um, consumer electronics, uh, house, household electronics more specifically. And I have never seen a factory this clean, this perfect. It was, it was you know, obviously um, uh, a, a Six Sigma Kanban factory. You could see where everything's lined up on the floor and so on. It was just extraordinary. And not President Xi, but the chairman before him and actually come and visited the factory. Yeah. We go in and they say, let's meet in the coffee shop. Mm -hmm. They have a coffee shop inside of it. It was, I felt like I was visiting a, a Western factory. It was so perfect, so wonderful. Their engineers were spot on, their quality control. They were doing everything um, from, from vibrations of traveling and drop tests to what the decibel levels were of certain machines being turned on and mm. off. I mean, it was just so cool. And it's great to see this because people say, oh, China's got terrible quality. No. There Do you are know what it sounds like? It sounds stuff. like a, a, 
a more of a modern car factory, you know, yes. super clean environment, and high of, efficiency, lots of automation. and lots of automation. Oh yeah. my goodness! I saw one thing where they um, they're doing a coffee maker, mm. and there's a tiny, tiny, tiny bead, mm. sort of this big like funnel, yeah. and you see all the beads in there, and a tiny rod pushes up from the bottom with a single bead balanced on the top, and the robotic arm comes over with its optical lens, sees it, picks it up, moves it, places it in it exactly where it needs to be. Um, and I've seen demonstrations of this at different, you know, expos, but to see it working so perfectly again and again. Um, this is, you know, China does have a lot of technology. Mm. They make Lenovo computers. Yeah. They make the Huawei phone. Mm. Um, they're able to well, do this. I mean, Shenzhen's obviously the electronics place, but in terms of factories, pound for pound, when you go to all the different districts and stuff. Where do you think is the highly, most highly concentrated of the advanced factories, the, the, the kind of ones that you're discussing? Is it mainly in Shenzhen? I would say more than just Shenzhen. I would say Shenzhen, Guangzhou, Fu, yeah. Foshan, the whole area in between. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Shanghai, you would think it would be, mm. but since the rent is so expensive and the property is so expensive in Shanghai, it doesn't yeah. make sense for... for yeah, they can't make the margins. Yeah. They need to run the factories and stuff. Yeah, Quite they're yeah. businesses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. I um, love it. I loved being back there. What do you, I mean, do you not get a little bit homesick? I mean, 48 days away like that. For me, I've always had this, hate's a strong word, is that love and hate with China because I've been over so many times and I've had nothing but nightmares with transport. So that's tarnished me going nothing to do with anything else. I love Hong Kong, but there's certain things I always struggle with is the, the consistency of the type of food. It's not my type of food I like to eat. Equally, I don't want to eat McDonald's, but I found that kind of tough in some places is that consistency of week after week. Like I was literally, because I wasn't a lover of their, their, the traditional dishes and the food, um, it's like you're always trying to find some chicken and you're trying to get um, like single... Uh, single ingredient food does that make sense oh, yeah. like can i have some chicken but not with like the sauces or the uh, or the soups and stuff like that and i'm not a big fish eater so i find that i found that about china quite tough for me do you see what i mean oh yeah it was either that or when you when you're down um and you're down on the on your boots on the ground you're walking over in the uh the what's it called all the food places are like, yeah, you've got fast food there, you've got McDonald's and stuff, but how long are you going to live off McDonald's? So I found that, I know Kian loves it, and I know uh, there's a lot of sellers like Chris Davey lives there, and they, they enjoy the food. But that was one of my toughest things, is certainly when it comes to the food over a, a long period of time, the two weeks or three weeks that you're there for. First thing I had when I got back to the United States was a Taco Bell Mexican pizza. Right. Okay. Pure, pure crap food. Yeah. But I had such an urging for it. Yeah. Now, the interesting thing is that, you know, when you go to the Canton Fair, you go to Shenzhen, you're, you're, you're all of that um, food is basically the same region and same mm. type of food, Cantonese yeah. food. Then you go to different areas, you know, you go up to um, uh, further north and it gets spicier and so mm. on. You go up to Qingdao, which is also the place where they make the beer. Yeah. And the food's more wheat-based, right? And and just plain, yeah. Um, and and had some. Next time you're there, if you have any chance to go up there, it's it's just south of Beijing. Yeah. Um, you try the food there; it's very very different. Mm. Now in Guangzhou, everyone's going to tell you in Guangzhou who comes yeah. from Guangzhou. Oh, Guangzhou's got the best food in the world. Mm. But in China, if you go away from Guangzhou, even as far as Ningbo, even as close as Ningbo, yeah. and you ask them what they think of food in Guangzhou, yeah. they're all going to laugh and tell you in Guangzhou they'll eat anything. Yeah, and I mean, I've seen the food in beetles. Shenzhen is more. What's the word? It's more westernized. Like there's more opportunity to eat at different places, yeah. square by square. You know, so if you're if you're in Guangzhou and stuff, you have to seek these places out generally. But then in Shenzhen, it's quite easy to... I'm trying to remember the name of it, where they've got the, the big boat. You know, mm -hmm. where they're... It's, got, it's very much like a modernised city that you could, you know, a Sydney or a London or something like that. They've kind of booked more, obviously, a lot cleaner, etc. Well, next time you're, you're in Guangzhou, let me know. There's a great area that has mm. German restaurants, Italian restaurants, yeah. um, uh, Middle Eastern restaurants, literally in a big circle. It's right yeah. near the river. Yeah. And then, of course, there's the party pier. Oh, of course. So I spent, there. <laughs> I spent too many nights at the party pier, <laughs> trust me, rocking in at five o'clock in the morning. Um, but, yeah. Oh, man, I had a, we had our, our last night dinner there. Mm. 
and um, Leiden and Kien had their last night dinner there. Yeah. So they invited our group to come on over and join them afterwards. Yeah. And it was just, you know, it's it, it felt like nothing had stopped. Yeah. Like the party just kept on going from pre-COVID to post-COVID. Yeah. And we're all there. It yeah. was just wonderful. It's a vibe. And then when the, when Chris Davey puts his Wednesdays on on the second. Um, in the second phase, and all the sellers get together. That's wonderful as well. You see all the sellers from around the world, three or four hundred. It's about three hundred, isn't it? Two fifty to three hundred. Uh, Michael Michelini. Yeah, yeah, he was there as well. Yeah, and um, and oh, so many familiar faces. In fact, the best feeling I had was when I got there, mm. and uh, I got there on the very first day of phase one. But I had a factory visit in the morning, so I came in around noon time. Mm. The lines were already gone. I was able to just get up. Um, I went up, I got on between C and, uh, and AB, yeah. and I'm going across that bridge. Mm. And within 10 minutes of coming there, I say, here are people, Stephen, Stephen, come over mm. here. And it was just like, I'm home. Yeah. This is great. Oh, yeah. oh, this is a big one. Go on. They've got a new section, a new complex. It's right. A, B, C, and D. Right. It's the size of an airport terminal. Right. It is now the largest exposition facility in the world. Mm. It is. So what's been dropped in today then? They just spread out more. Okay. So um, typically things that you might find... Because from memory, I haven't been since about eight, 2018, 19, and they're all separated in, in the zones. Yeah. Right, right. So, so they're still separated into yeah. the zones, but there is also a focus on clean and green energy right. um, in Section D, and there's also a large exposition space within mm. Section D, yeah. but it's just like Section A doubled over again. Yeah. And it looks the same, it's got the same design, but there is no way now to do the entire, every section mm. during the four days. You yeah. have to know what you're looking for when you go in there. Yeah. You well, know? you've got to pre-plan it, don't you? You work out zone by zone, you work out the area and you go, we'll take this area, we'll get that done in the morning, that'll be the afternoon, and then you're going to have the amount of days that you've allocated to go in. And you never hit all the, all your numbers, but you do go in with yeah, a plan. Yeah, you prioritise them. You prioritise every element of it, and depending on what exit and entrance is, what train you come in, or whether you've got the coach in, or there's a hotel public, like the hotel transportation. Oh, yeah. And yeah. there's um there's a dock now that goes right up to the Canton Fair. I haven't tried it out, but mm. I'm curious to actually take the ferry right up to the Canton Fair complex. Wow. Yeah. That could be fun. Yes, indeed. Look, as we wrap here, let's just quickly go back to the, the key content on the podcast. The red flags from the factory they were using, uh, what's the word? What am I looking Questionable for? labor. Questionable labor. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's, you know, as I said, you always look for the same four things. Mm. Core. Yeah. You know, look at the production floor, look at their offices, look at the, and the offices will have certifications on the mm. wall and so on. The showroom will will show what their products are. Mm. Um, look at the, the QA and look at the, the, the uh, in and out warehousing. Mm. Um, and those are the places you examine. That's where you can see red flags. In yeah. this case, I saw the red flags in the fact that this, there was no showroom in the first one. Mm. The second showroom had a curtain over the wall where their certifications are. Yeah. And then the difference between the two um, production floors. Yeah. And just because I've been in a lot of cut and sew factories, I was able to identify that there were mm. stations that were recently evacuated and so on. Yeah. Um, those are the red flags. But I'll give you, there was another factory I went to that was a trading company, yeah. purely putting on a performance. Mm. We walked in and their showroom, huge, and they had 16 pieces. Mm. That was it. Yeah. Empty. That was a red flag. Yeah. So if you go, find someone who knows what they're doing. We yeah. just mentioned Kian. Kian is wonderful. I mm. go with people. Yeah. Uh, there's other people who really know what they're doing. So you mm. find Steve Simonson. And yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm. And what happens is they'll show you. They'll point it out to you. And mm. once you know what to look for, yeah. you can go to factories on your own. Mm. You, in fact, you can go to the Canton Fair on your own. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, a lot of people doing this really is where it kind of bolts stuff together. Like when a, a lot of seller friends of mine, if they've, if it's their first time, I then put them in touch with Chris Davey and I'd get them into the WeChat groups and stuff like that, just so that when they land, they know there's other people around them to, as a support, community support. Does that make and sense? And it gives confidence. Yeah, exactly. You know, there's a safety net around you. Yeah, exactly. It's a beautiful thing. It really is. It's a different country. The language, obviously, is not something most people speak. The mm. signs are not something you're familiar with. But as entrepreneurs, yeah. we are a community. Mm. And just align yourself with others, and you have that as a safety net. 
like you said, you know, the right WeChat groups mm. and stuff like that. And if that gives you the confidence, go out there and do it because it can change your business. Yeah. Okay, Sim, thank you for joining us today. Guys, thank you for your time and attention. Uh, take care of yourself and your family. Much love.